salivary secretion is not essential for life but it is highly important for oral hygiene. So how does this salivary secretion occur? There are three main salivary glands, parotid, submandibular and sublingual. So these three are major salivary glands but apart from them there are many minor salivary glands located throughout oral mucosa. Now each salivary gland opens with a duct into the mouth. So this is the common duct which opens into the mouth. If we follow this duct we will see the duct branches into smaller ducts which finally ends into blind sac acinus. So this uh, red one here shown is the acinus. Each acinus is lined by epithelial cells which in turn are surrounded by myoepithelial cells. So these myoepithelial cells can actually contract and they help in uh, emptying the secretions which are present in the acinus into the duct. Now ducts are also lined by epithelial cells. These acinar cells form a primary salivary secretion which is very similar in composition to plasma. If we see the electrolyte composition of the salivary secretion, it will be almost same as that of plasma. But as formed salivary secretion travels through the duct, these ductal epithelial cells make some changes in the composition of the salivary secretion. So we will see at the cell level how these acinar cells are secreting the salivary secretion and how these ductal cells are modifying this secretion. First we will see how acinar cell forms salivary secretion. So right side shows the basolateral side and the left side is a luminal or apical side. So this area actually forms the lumen what we saw here and we have magnified this particular cell. So this portion is the basolateral side here is the luminal side of the cell. So we will see how various transporters are working to bring about salivary secretion. Now whenever we are seeing the role of the transporters first thing is the role of the sodium potassium ATPase which as a rule of thumb is always present on the basolateral membrane. So a sodium potassium ATPase is throwing out three sodium and bringing in two potassium inside the cell. Because of this there develops a concentration gradient for sodium to move inside the cell. However, the concentration gradient of potassium will drive it outside the cell. Now because of the function of the sodium potassium ATPase, sodium moves into the cell along its concentration gradient and along with it chloride ion also moves. So you see the concentration of two ions increases in the cell potassium and chloride. These potassium and chloride move along their concentration into the lumen. So potassium moves from cell into the lumen via potassium channel and chloride also moves from cell into the lumen. But along with chloride another ion also moves from inside the cell to outside and that is bicarbonate ion. Now from where is this bicarbonate coming? It is generated when carbon dioxide inside the cell binds with water in presence of another enzyme carbonic anhydrase and produces two ions bicarbonate and H plus ions. So bicarbonate ions move from inside the cell to the lumen but H plus ions move from from inside the cell to the basolateral side and this occurs in exchange of sodium. Sodium via paracellular route into the lumen. So in acinous cell sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate all are coming into the lumen. But ductal epithelial cell has another set of transporters by which it is able to modify the salivary secretion which is passing through the duct. But again as a rule of thumb, basolateral membrane is having sodium potassium ATPase. Now again you see that it is creating a concentration gradient for sodium to move inside the cell. But here instead of sodium moving from basolateral membrane into the ductal cell, it moves from lumen into the cell. So there are other transporters and compared to SNS cell, there is sodium hydrogen exchanger which causes sodium to move inside the cell and hydrogen to move outside the cell. Plus there is potassium hydrogen exchanger but if you see potassium is high in the cell. So potassium goes out and hydrogen moves in. So there is a recycling of hydrogen which is going on. It is moving out and in and with that it is moving sodium in and potassium out. Now there is another transporter chloride bicarbonate exchanger. This is different from which we saw in the acinar cell. Here chloride and bicarbonate move in opposite direction thus causing chloride movement into the cell and this chloride starts accumulating in the cell thus it has to move out towards the 
basolateral site. But if you see what are the changes made in the composition of the salivary secretion. In the lumen, the concentration of electrolytes was same as that in plasma, but the ductal cell has caused the reabsorption of sodium, the reabsorption of chloride, and there is more secretion of potassium and bicarbonate out of the cell. In addition, more ions are absorbed than they are secreted, but water is not able to pass from basolateral membrane to the lumen. So, more absorption of ions leads to the salivary secretion becoming hypotonic. So initially in the acinar cell it is isotonic but later on in the duct it becomes hypotonic with more potassium and bicarbonate and less sodium and chloride. But it has been found that there are differences in concentration of these electrolytes in saliva at different flow rates means that uh, different uh, stimulation of uh, salivary glands. If there is very high uh, stimulation, the electrolyte concentration is different. Now, what is happening is that at very high flow rates, these ductal cells are not able to act upon the saliva which is crossing through the ducts. So, they are not able to reabsorb sodium. They are not able to secrete potassium into the saliva. But bicarbonate is an exception. What happens that whenever these glands and uh, ductal cells are stimulated, there is a stimulation of bicarbonate secretion also. That means with high flow rate, the salivary secretion will become more and more alkaline. It makes sense also because one of the stimulus which causes increase in salivary secretion is uh, acidic sour foods. So it is important that salivary secretion is alkaline and neutralizes these in our mouth. So it is having some protective effect. It is buffering the excess acid present in mouth. So now what are the stimulants for salivary secretion? Well salivary secretion wholly is controlled by nerves. There are very very few hormones from blood and the effect which they are having on salivary secretion. So these nerves which control the salivary secretion are parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves. That is it is having autonomic control. Now, in salivary secretions, both act hand in hand. They are the best friends in the air. That parasympathetic secretion also stimulates salivary secretion and sympathetic stimulation also stimulates salivary secretion. However, the composition of saliva differs a bit. Arasympathetic mostly causes increase in watery secretion and sympathetic stimulation causes uh, increase in mucin and enzymatic secretion is Increase. Now one very interesting fact about salivary secretion is that volume of saliva which is secreted per gram of tissue is largest secretion of any of body's exocrine glands. So you can understand how it is so essential for oral hygiene and the resting flow of saliva is 0.5 ml per minute which can increase to a maximum of 4 ml per minute. So if so much saliva is uh, secreted, what are the functions of this? Saliva. Saliva has basically three functions, lubrication, protection and digestion. Now, as you eat food, uh, there is increase in salivary secretion and what it does, it helps in uh, making formation of a bolus out of the food and thus it also helps in swallowing of the food because a round bolus is formed and uh, which is smoother because of lubrication. Then it also protects the oral cavity. There are certain proteins in salivary secretion like uh, lysozyme. Lysozyme breaks down bacterial cell wall. There is a lactoferrin uh, as the name suggests. This lactoferrin chelates the ferrous iron and uh, it deprives the microbes of the essential iron content. Then there is also secretory IgA antibodies which are present in the saliva. Not only that, there are certain minerals also present in saliva like fluoride, calcium, phosphates. Some demineralization is always occurring uh, from our tooth because of uh, bacterial decay. But if salivary secretion is normal, these minerals present in the saliva will replenish the minerals which are depleted due to bacterial decay. Then there are enzymes for digestion. For carbohydrate digestion there is alpha amylase and for lipid digestion there is lipase. But uh, in normal scenario, especially alpha amylase contributes a lot to carbohydrate digestion but even if it is absent, no abnormalities have been found in digestion. Now with these functions in mind, you can very well predict what will happen if uh, 
salivary secretion decreases. This condition is known as xerostomia, that is dry mouth. There will be problem in lubrication and uh, bolus formation, so swallowing will be affected. Plus, if uh, proper lubrication is not there, person will not be able to speak also. So, speech will also be affected. And you see the protection provided by our salivary secretion will not be there and there may be development of dental caries. So, this condition, xerostomia, that is dry mouth, occurs very commonly with uh, certain medications. Since we know that parasympathetic and sympathetic nerve supply increases salivary secretion, anticholinergics, which block parasympathetic secretion and uh, beta blockers which block sympathetic stimulation will lead to zero stone. It is most commonly due to medications but there are multiple other reasons also.